Hello, everyone, and welcome to the today's live webinar. Uh, today, I'm going to just going to review about motor evoke potential. Um, I know almost all of you have uh, are you doing motor evoke potential on a regular basis and know all the setups and signals and everything. So I don't want to go into too det detail about the signal um, recordings and interpretation, but I want to go back into the basics of fundamentals and go on to rev review with you uh, today. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my window the screen is pause Okay, so I'm going to talk about the basic anatomy. First, sorry for that uh, technical things. Okay, so the function of the motor evoke potential, there are two basic functions on uh, the motor pathway, uh, gross movement, posture and balance and communication, uh, speech, and also it comes into the motor uh, pathway. They are guided by sensory inputs. So their internal representation of world and uh, the person and it detects changes in the environment through different sensory input and you have motor function there are three classes of movement we have voluntary movement we have reflexes and we have rhythmic motor patterns the voluntary movements are complex actions such as reading writing playing piano or playing soccer uh, they are purposeful they are goal oriented uh, you have a purpose to do that and you, you initiate them and they are learned movement. They improve over practice. The second one is reflexes. They are involuntary and they're rapid and stereotype, that is coughing, knee jerk, uh, ankle jerk, and they're graded control by eliciting uh, stimulators. The third one is a combination of both of them, which is rhythmic motor patterns. Uh, so it's a combination of voluntary and reflexes, such as walk, walking and running. Uh, the initiation, uh, the start of the move pattern is voluntary and termination is voluntary, but once initiated, it's repetitive and reflexes. Such as if you're walking, you don't have to stick every step. So you just need to start the first step and you can continue walking. And when you want to stop walking or going up the stair and going down the stair, you just stop that. So the primary motor cortex, uh, the central circus divides the motor part of the brain from the sensory part. Everything anterior to the central circus is um, motor. Um, in this picture, you have pre-central gyrus, which is a primary motor gyrus, and anterior to the, it is responsible for the gross movement. The gyrus anterior to the pre-central gyrus is called pre-motor gyrus, and pre-motor gyrus is responsible for fine motor movement. Uh, so the, the gyrus posterior to the central circus is post central gyrus, which is sensory. So everything posterior to that is sensory and everything anterior is, is motor. So including the speech area is also anterior because part of a motor and memory, Wernicke area it, and the visual area, they all sensory and the posterior. So the primary motor cause is control uh, motor function. Again, the primary motor gyrus is the som somatic motor area. It is also known as Broadman area four. The Broadman has categorized the uh, cortex into different areas, and the area number four is the primary motor gyrus. Um, so the, there are three names: premotor gyrus, pre uh, sorry, precentral gyrus, primary motor gyrus, and Broadman area four. So the pyramidal cells are the main cells. They originate from the primary motor area. They are large cells and they control the specific area of the body. And the representation of the body is known as homunculus. It's a body map of the motor cortex and same as sensory cortex is known as sensory homunculus. 
the corticospinal tracts are the tracts which originate from the cortex and they descend down to control the different muscles of the body. So the other area uh, anterior to, like we saw in the previous picture, the area located anterior to the precentral gyrus is known as premotor gyrus. It controls more complex movement. It controls voluntary actions and it's dependent on sensory feedback, uh, such as visual feedback, auditory feedback, and general somatic sensory. It involves the planning of the movement. So initiation and planning of the movement is uh, located in premotor area. The frontal eye field is the area anterior to the premotor and it lies anterior to the premotor cortex and it controls the voluntary movement of the eye. So eye movements are controlled by the motor area known as frontal eye field, which is a third gyrus anterior to the central sulcus. So if you are in process of um, doing a surgery on aneurysm or tumor on the brain, so these, more, these areas are very, very important because damage to one of these primary motor gyrus will lead damage to the gross motor movement, damage to the premotor gyrus will lead to a lack of initiation or planning and damage to the frontal eye field will lead to damage of the eye movement. The Broca's area is the third uh, motor area. It is loco located in the left cerebral hemisphere. It manages speech production and it corresponds to region of the right hemisphere. So it has right and left side. And again, Broca's area has three different areas, but we don't want to go into that detail today. The motor organ control is organized in two ways. One is parallel and the other is hierarchical. The parallel, they're running together and the pathways act simultaneously, such as movement arm, muscle producing movement, postural adjustment while you are moving and the rec recovery of function after a lesion. So, so this parallel, if there's a, one area is damaged, there's, there's a possibility of recovery because uh, because of the overlapping function. The hierarchical, on the other hand, has three levels of control uh, at the lowest level at spinal cord, brainstem, and cortex. Uh, division of responsibility to so the higher level, they are controlling the lower level. Um, the spinal cord is more complex and special, and each area receives sensory input uh, to perform the function. The motor neurons, uh, they are multiple different types of neurons. One is bipolar neuron, which are also known as interneuron. The second one is unipolar, uh, which is a sensory. It has it has one input and one output. Bipolar are interneurons. They connect the sensory and motor fibers. They have input on both sides. The multipolar neurons, uh, number three, they have multiple input, multiple dendrite input, and one output. They're mostly motor neurons. And the pyramidal cells are multi-neurons, and they have So if you do uh, look at the cross section of the of the gyrus, there are multiple layers. So we have layer number, the outer layer is layer one, then we have layer two, three, four, and five. Uh, so layer five is the layer where the motor neurons this originate. So the motor neurons, they originate from layer five of the primary motor gyrus. And if you look at this, the electron microscope picture, so the, ori the cell bodies of the motor neurons and pyramidal cells are in the fifth layer and they descend in the corticospinal tract and they have input and interneurons they connect uh, with the sensory cortex as well. So if you're looking at cross section of the pathway, so we have the foot area is in the middle uh, uh, on the midline and the hand area is outside. So the fibers from the lower extremity, upper extremity, they combine and they pass medial to the thalamus and they don't cross the thalamus so if there's a thalamus is damaged it's not going to affect your motor pathway one of the seen in exam question so they go through the corpus callosum uh, uh, under the corpus callosum uh, medial to the thalamus and they descend so while they are descending uh, 80 percent fibers they cross over to the other side in lower medulla uh, 20 percent 15 20 percent remain on the same side the fibers 80 percent fiber they cross over they remain on the lateral corticospinal tract. So the corticospinal tract, uh, there are two. One is lateral, or one is anterior. The one anterior, they are crossed over. The uh, sorry, the one lateral is the crossover, and the one in the anterior, uh, also known as ventral corticospinal tract, they remain on the same side, but they cross crossover at the segmental level. 
so if uh, just looking at this picture so you have all the fibers they coming uh, and then they have crossover at lower medulla and most of the fiber they cross over the other side the, and they supply the muscles on the opposite side the 20 percent remain on the ipsilateral side they cross over every segment so at this crossover c1 c2 c3 until sacral root so so the descending tract again they are um, cortical tracts and brainstem originated from brainstem the tract which originate from the cortex they are known as cortico bulbar cortico spinal uh, and cortico rubro spinal the one they originate from brainstem is vestibulo spinal tract reticulo spinal tract and tecto spinal tract so cortico bulbar are, uh, tracts are the tracts which project to the medulla and they they end in the nuclei, so this, the fibers start from the cortex, but they terminate at the nuclei of the cranial nerve and they supply the muscle of the face and tongue muscles. The corticospinal tract, which we are most of us familiar with, uh, they, they are the pyramidal tract, the pyramidal tract, and again, they cross over and stay on the same side. And the axon terminate in the gray matter of the spinal cord with the lower motor neuron. So those are the upper motor neurons and they make a synapse in the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord. So these axon of the corticospinal tract, they have 33% have one third of the fibers. They originate from the primary motor cortex, one third originate in the premotor area, and one third originate in the somatosensory cortex. So corticospinal tract, they are not only pure motor tract, they, they have 30, 30%, 33% of tracts are originated from the somatosensory cortex. And the third one is cortico rubro spinal tract. Uh, they originate from the red nucleus and receive from the which input receive the input from the motor cortex and also cerebellum. And these exon terminate in motor neurons in the spinal cord and they control arm and leg, but they don't control the fingers. So that's the important part. So the fibers originating from brainstem, the cortico reticulus spinal. Uh, they form the recti they do the reticular formation and they terminate in the gray matter of the spinal cord and they control the movement of the trunk uh, trunk proximal limb muscles and they're responsible for walking head turning and automatic function so if the cortico reticular spinal tract is damaged patient will not be able to um, control the movement of the proximal limb muscle the vestibulo spinal tract uh, they originate from vestibular nuclei and they have medial vestibular nuclei and the lateral vestibular and the cortico tectospinal they originate from superior colliculus. So anatomy of the spinal cord. So if you're working on the spinal cases every day, it's very important to know that the 3D anatomy of the spinal cord. So the gray matter in the brain is outside, the gray matter in the spinal cord is inside. So the gray matter, the white matter in the brain is inside, and the white matter in the spinal cord is outside. The gray matter, um, the exterior part is white matter in the spinal cord. It forms the funiculi or fasciculi, they are tracked, uh, fasciculi gracilis, uh, cuneatus for upper and lower extremity. They form the nerves and the root. The internal gray matter, uh, they are, they are gray, darker color because of the cell bodies, and they form the dorsal horns, they form the anterior horns, and they also form the dorsal root ganglia, which is outside the spinal cord. So the, uh, if you do the cross section of the spinal cord, you have sensory and motor. So the sensory is the most uh, posterior dorsal part uh, with the fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus, uh, and also have spinal uh, the sp uh, spinal cerebellar tract and anterior. Uh, so and you also have the anterior motor tracts and the lateral motor tract. The lateral motor tracts are the 80% which have already crossed over, and they they exit through the anterior roots and they join with the dorsal root and form the nerve. The one which are ant um, anterior corticospinal tracts, so they cross over to the other side. So in case the patient have a screw damage or something, the uh, hemi cord syndrome or also known uh, as um, um, brown secret syndrome is a patient has that, the patient will have damage uh, to the distal muscles on the same side and proximal muscle on the ipsilateral side because the right side is controlling the, the distal muscle on the right side and the proximal muscle on the left side. So. 
motor unit so motor units again is always the exam questions motor unit have four parts it's composed of anterior horn cells anterior horn cells it's in the spinal cord the anterior horns and it has lower motor neurons and it has neuromuscular junction and then the muscle fiber so the four part they form the motor unit Uh, the motor lower motor neurons they follow all in none principles so if you if they are activated they will fire or if they're not so there will be no contraction on a th uh, on a different threshold value either they will fire or they will not fire um, so the fine control is uh, uh, why the motor units are important because all the muscles which are responsible for fine motor control they have more one to one muscle to nerve ratios and the one which are not responsible like a um, quadriceps muscle or trunk muscle they have one to five hundred a very high muscle ratio so the gross movement control you don't need the uh, good ratio but fine for thumb fingers uh, eye movement you need more fine control so as we saw the, the homunculus in the brain you have the foot areas in the midline the hand and face and tongue is on the outside uh, the homunculus in the we also have a homunculus in the spinal cord the homunculus in the spinal cord is that the proximal muscles they are more in the midline and the uh, distal muscles are more outside so the spinal cord is damaged uh, the outer part of the spinal cord is damaged patient will, will not be able to move the hand or feet uh, but if the if the patient has central cord syndrome or more uh, uh, central uh, damage or, is going to affect more proximal muscle deltoid shoulder hamstrings and quadriceps So I just want to uh, talk uh, quickly about the force production. So force production is um, there are some uh, points. So summation, summation is the combination of the motor units. They are activated at the one time. So more units they are activated, you will have more forceful potential. So if looking at this picture, so you have the time in millisecond and the um, so there's a stimulus and there's a latent patent. So if you stimulate in the latent patent, you cannot cause any contraction. But if you stimulate after that, there's a contraction and followed by relaxation. So size of motor, uh, so number of motor units. So if you have more motor units, uh, the twitch will be more powerful. And if you activate the larger number of fibers, the potential will be much bigger. So number of motor units. So this diagram is telling you, telling us the number of motor units contraction. So you have the first picture is one unit, two unit, three unit, four unit. So you can see the number of motor uh, unit contracting or activated. The signal is getting bigger and bigger, and we have the highest at the eight units. And then, as the units are recruiting less, it's getting smaller and smaller. For for summation, so the number of motor units is very very important. The second thing is number of motor uh, activated. Of, one time so increasing the st stimulus so if you're increasing the stimulation or increase the voltage to activate a motor response uh, that when you're increasing the threshold the response will be maximum but at one place it will peak out and that will be super maximal response and if you go higher than that you're not going to get any better response um, another uh, important is like the time between the stimulation so when we increase the uh, time between stimulation the signal will be lower and if you decrease the time between stimulation the signal will get bigger and bigger and you can actually get to the tetany so when you're doing the anesthesia they're doing train of four uh, in the or they stimulate at 50 hertz and patient have a tetanic response so this is uh, why i'm talking about this because the motor unit so when doing MEP, we are running, uh, we are doing MEP in uh, using train. And the reason we are doing train is because the upper motor neurons cannot activate the lower motor neuron unless you send a second signal before that. So the time between two signal is very, very important. So if you stimulate too fast, you cause tightness and you cannot activate any muscle. If you stimulate too lo low, you'll not be able to uh, recruit the response again. So size, uh, the smallest motor units are recruited first and the largest are recruited last. 
So when you increase the stimulation, uh, when we increase the frequency of stimulation, the force of contraction of motor units increased. So, uh, the low tension movement can be achieved by final graded steps and increased uh, frequency of stimulation causes recruitment of additional and larger motor units. And so, so synapse, synapse, uh, Synapse is a junction between two neurons. Uh, for motor evoke potential, they are junction between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. For sensory, it's a junction between first order, second, second and third order, and third and fourth. But for uh, for talking about MEP, so every time there's a synapse, it's going to increase the time or there's a delay. And in order to activate the lower motor neurons, we have two types of summation. Either we can do temporal summation or we can do spatial summation. So a temporal summation is depending on the repeated stimuli occurring at the brief time and have same input. So that's what we do in train. We are doing a repetitive stimuli and causing the recruitment of the lower motor neurons and that is known as temporal summation. If we are increasing the stimulation strength and we are activating the more fibers and we have multiple inputs, that's called a spatial summation. So spatial summation is called by having impulses from several neurons into the same input and temporal summation is several impulses from the same neuron. The post synaptic potentials, uh, uh, they can be excitatory or inhibitory. The excitatory have graded depolarization. So all the all the post synaptic potential, they cause excitation, they are cause depolarization. All the post synaptic potential, they cause inhibition, they cause hyperpolarization. And it it is the the combination between the uh, excitatory and uh, inhibitory post synaptic potential that this. Um, so if the excitatory are higher than inhibitory, so the output will be excitation. If inhibition, the activation of inhibitory are higher, the output will not be excitation of the lower motor neuron. So when we are doing uh, MEP stimulation, the uh, we are stimulating the cortex, uh, the anode and cathodes. So the computer, the electro, the comp the machine is always stimulated from negative to positive. The current always travel from negative to positive the electrons travel from positive to negative. Uh, when we put the electron uh, on the brain, the computer doesn't know that the electrodes are placed on the brain, so it still stimulates from cathode to uh, anode. But because of the, uh, the, the, the anatomy of the brain, the anodal side uh, or the side where the brain of the, uh, the under the anode, the brain is activated more under the anode than the cathode. So we always have, that's why it is known as anodal stimulation. <clears throat> so motor and evoke potential, they are known as anodal stimulation because the anodal side is activated more than the cathodal side, not because the anode is stimulating. So uh, every time you're doing settings, you have to make sure uh, the muscles recorded are opposite to the anodal side and they are not opposite to the cathodal side. So for uh, we use Cadwell machine. So if you have Cadwell machine in the motor box, there's a black and red. The black should be always the left side and the red should, should be always the right side. And if you have C3 and C4 or C1, C2, the two and four should be always on the red output. If the C2, four is on the red output, then if you stimulate in normal mode, you always get a response from the left side. If you stimulate with the reverse mode, you'll get a response from the right side. It will invert the polarity. So moving the method methodology, so the trans motor evoke potential, there are two types of motor evoke potential. One is called transcranial magnetic motor evoke potential. The second one is transcranial electrical motor evoke potential. The transcranial magnetic motor evoke potential, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but it is magnet activation of the motor cortex by a big magnet by placing on the, on the scalp and uh, it causes electrical stimulation activation and you can record the same. Uh, it is pain, painless, so you can do uh, it's mostly used in the clinic and outpatient and awake patient. So if you're doing magnetic stimulation, it's, uh, it doesn't cause any pain as compared to electrical stimulation because it's, it's painful, so you cannot do on awake patient. The mag magnet is difficult to place in intubated patient. It moves and you can lose the signal, plus it causes a magnetic field. So you have to make sure there's no metallic um, object around the patient, which is not possible unless you are doing in the 
like the MRI suite, interoperative MRI. So if you don't have interoperative MRI, then we don't use the magnetic motor evoke potential. And we use only transcranial electrical motor evoke potential. And motor evoke potential can be uh, done by elect constant electrical stimulation or constant motor, uh, uh, constant voltage stimulation. And uh, if you're doing constant current stimulation, then you play the play increase the changes the uh, current. But if you have constant voltage stimulation, which is in case of Cadwell or Medtronic machine, you change the voltage. So briefly going back, the first machine which was FDA approved for motor evoke potential in US in 2000 2001 was Digitimer. It was an FDA first FDA approved device, and it was. It's a British, uh, UK-based company. So if you look at the picture, the the one on the top is the first device. Um, it was Digitimer 185, and the the one on the bottom is the more advanced, the newer version DS8R. So the um, on the looking at the first picture on the top, D uh, D uh, D185, Digitimer 185. So if you look at the the train, uh, there's a switch we can change the number of pulses. It's a pulses on top and there's a button you can push. You can, and it's a single digit, so you can go from one to nine. So there's no option of going to 10 or zero. So there's one to nine. The next one is ISI, inter-stimulus interval, and there are two digits and you can press the button and you can go from 1.0 to 9.9 .9 on this machine. So the, the pulses is the number of pulses you are sending. The ISI is the, time between the beginning of the first pulse to the beginning of the second pulse. It's not the time from the end of the pulse to the end of the beginning of the second. It's the time from the beginning of the first to the beginning of the second pulses. Um, then there's a, a window for the voltage output and the current. The voltage is fixed because the constant voltage, the, it just tell you how much current is going. And uh, we have another switch next to the voltage, which is polarity. Left is up positive and the right is negative. Um, and the dial is to increase the voltage. You can go from zero to 1000 volt. And uh, the square button is to press. Once you press it, it causes, it um, it stimulates and you get, and the output again, you can increase the output up and down. And the red and black are your stimulator. So this was the first device and wanted everyone to see that and this is the basis of setting up your motor pro protocol so if you're using any machine Cadwell, Medtronic, the X, Med, Exeltech, Nihon Kodan, the whole basis of setting up all the machines were approved they applied for FDA and they used the same and this machine was uh, 50 microsecond uh, the pulse rate so everything is set up so when you're setting the any motor testing so it is based on this one so uh, so you play with these numbers. So motor evoke potential, it, we can uh, have a benefit in different type of surgery, orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, vascular surgery, interventional surgery. Um, everyone knows about orthopedic and, uh, and neurosurgery and uh, beside the uh, spinal cord tumor, brain tumor, brainstem tumors, subcortical tumors, Brain aneurysm brain is very helpful in doing that. A lot of literature published in the in <coughs> benefit of uh, utilizing MEP in the AVMs. Uh, aneurysm clipping and and coiling also for AVM embol uh, uh, obliteration or embol embolization. Tether cord releases, uh, spinal cord tumors, vascular surgeries for thoracic abdominal aneurysm repair or carotid and direct-me. We can also do MEP. And interventional suite, uh, if you're working in INR, you can coiling, intercrism, or spinal EVM. Um, we, a uh, lot of literature on that. So contraindication for MEP, there used to be a long list of contraindication uh, in the past, uh, 20 years ago, but it's fading out. Uh, the common contraindication in the past were epilepsy, burr hole, defect in skull, uh, previous history of seizures, metal implant, but all of those are not obsolete. We don't use them because we are doing MEP in a weak patient. We are doing MEP in the patient with the uh, with open brain. So burr hole and defect is not liberal. We do MEP in a patient 
or who they come with the seizures and the brain because of the brain tumor and so all you have to do is give a you have to make sure that if a patient has a seizure the stimulation can cause seizures so we have to give an anti anti-epileptic drug uh cap capra or dilantin or something preoperative so patient doesn't go there are very few incidents of patient going to seizures due to the motor evoke potential so technically there are no contraindication but there are some alerts so you have to be careful if the patient is under two year old um, you should always use core screw but if the patient is under two year old uh, you have to be careful because the skull is not formed you have fontanel anterior lateral fontanel posterior fontanel and the skull is very thin so you have to use needle and you don't want to stimulate too high the patient has seizures so it's not a contraindication but you need to make sure the patient has an epileptic anti-epileptic drug given before the surgery or during the surgery if the patient has a pacemaker we need to talk to the surgeon beforehand and there's somebody from the pacemaker company they come and they put a magnet and it deactivate you cannot turn it off but you can deactivate so it doesn't burn the patient has cochlear implant you still have to make sure the surgeon want that because they have implant in the brain so if you are doing mep you have to be careful you are not uh, stimulating too high or very the stimulator is not close to the cochlear implant same for deep brain stimulation because it can damage them so just looking at the uh, anatomy for the stimulation side, we have the central sulcus, this white line, and the motor cortex is anterior, the sensory is posterior, and the distance bit is not less than half centimeter. It's not even thicker. Uh, it's, it's thicker than your finger, size of finger. So you have to be make careful when your sensory electrode and motor electrodes are not too far. I've seen people putting like two, three inches apart, many, many. So the motor cortex and sensory cortex is very, very close. And uh, so the measurement of the head is important because if you put electrode in the head any place, you'll get some response for SSCP. It may not be correct response. If you have anterior, it may be flipped upside down. It may be small, inverted. But for motor evoke potential, if you're not in the motor gyrus and you put the electrode anterior, posterior, you're not going to activate. So in order to activate, you have to go very, very high in stimulus. And if you go very high, patient will move too much and patient will jump. And at the end, the surgeon will say, stop doing motors until I tell you or at the end of the case. So if you measure the head and you put the electrode right on, you can get motor MEP response at less than 200, less than 150. Uh, and you can do continue with minimal patient movement. And using the C1, C2 uh, can also be very, very helpful. So uh, the placement of the electrode for stimulation is critical because uh, all the parts on the on the brain, they have or the skull, they have different impedance. So the bone has the cancellous bone has the highest uh, high percent, 2500 ohms. Compact bone has about 6000 ohms impedance. So the lowest impedance is CSF. So if you are right on the CSF, you can cause create a good response. White matter is about 80 to 800, uh, and the blood is about 160. Skin is 230. Gray matter is 300. Soft tissue is 500. So when we're putting C3, C4, we are trying to put right on the gyrus or close to the gyrus. So uh, you are in the, because the gray matter has lower impedance. If you are in the white matter the, or you are uh, on more lateral side, you are in cancellous bone. So the impedance is very, very high and you will not get to get response. So when we activate the C3, C4, or C1, C2, C1, C2 are in more midline. The current goes from and again cathode to anode but activates the anode side more than the cathode side so again you can measuring cpz uh, cz C, 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 cz prime and you have c3 on the left side c4 prime and c1 c2 and c3 c4 are the most important side you can also put m1 m2 m3 m4 uh, they are also in the literature one inch interior uh, you can have C1, C2, you can do C3, C, you can do C1, CZ, you can do C2, CZ, you can have multiple combination uh, to get a better response. Corkscrew electrodes should always be used. They are easy to place uh, if you get comfortable because their tip is sharp, but if you go straight there, you cannot put them. So you have to put an angle so it goes into skin and then rotate them and they're less likely to pull out. They have a lower impedance because if you look at the size of the, so the, the whole, if you're stimulating at 200 volt, the whole voltage is spread over the this area and it will have less chances of skin burn, uh, which is very high with the needles. And you, you, you are activating more area on the brain 
compared to the pin needle because nin is thin pin uh, tip so it will be activating only one and have higher incidence of burn and and um, more risk of staying uh, away from like putting it away from the motor side so you have core screw you have more like half centimeter area covered and and if you measure the head you, uh, less likely you will not get a response so for stimulation parameters uh, duration we do is 50 to 75 microsecond the rate um, the option we have one to nine pulses but preferable five to seven pulses and if you're doing craniotomy three between three and five pulses <laughs> So uh, in DigiTimer, there, uh, there was a built-in uh, safety mechanism, which is also in the other machine. If you go, you stimulate at 700 volts and you have nine pulses, the, all the pulses will not be 700. So the first pulse may be 700, the second will be uh, 680, the third will be 650, and it will go down uh, because you cannot stimulate uh, more than, I, uh, for DigiTimer, you cannot stimulate more than 560 volt in nine, uh, nine pulses. So you have to be, even you put uh, set up the system at 1000 volt it will go it will cut off at 500 so if you want to stimulate at higher threshold you have to decrease your number of trains so going always on nine or eight pulses doesn't mean that you're going to get better response you may get a worse response than the previous one the interest stimulus interval is two to five milliseconds so the fastest you go is two the slowest you can go to five and uh, uh, the reason is the threshold of the cortical neuron is 200 hertz. So if you stimulate less than 200 hertz, you cannot activate the cortical neuron. 200 hertz means 1000 millisecond divided by 200 is, is, is five. So five millisecond is the highest, slowest you can slowest you can go. So you have to be faster than five uh, to activate the cortical neur neurons. So. So anything 4.14 or below is fine. So two will be stimulated two, two ISI for two, then you're stimulating at 500 Hertz. So you're going to faster, so you're activating. But again, there's a catch. So if you stimulate, if you want to activate the upper extremity, you have to go fast. If you want to estimate the lower extremity, the distance longer, so you have to stimulate at slow rate. So if you're getting, uh, when you're doing troubleshooting, if you're not, getting good lower MEP responses, you make sure you make sure that um, you are stimulating at slow ISI, bigger ISI. So I'm um, just showing this image. So this is from one of the papers. So the threshold of the cortical neurons is 200 Hertz. If you stimulate less than 200 Hertz, the time between each stimulus is slower and it's not going to cause a uh, 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 CMAP response. So if you go f 200 to 400, you'll have a much better response. So there are multi multiple muscle responses you can do. Upper extremity, we use parallel uh, subdermal needles. If you, we have options, if a patient is obese and, um, or uh, the BMI, BMI is very high, we have options of longer needles. We have 25 millimeter. 18 to millimeter 25 37 and 50 millimeter long needles the typical muscles which are recorded from upper extremity are deltoid bicep brachii brachioradialis flexor carpi radialis and ulnaris abductor pollicis brevis and digitimini for lower extremity the iliosoas is the most difficult muscle because it's very very deep it's inside the ilium unless you're using a very long needle the 37 millimeter or longer 25 millimeter you will not be able to achieve so the other options are adductor magnus vastus lateralis and medialis tibialis anterior peroneus longus which is next to the, to the tibialis anterior gastronemius extensor halosis brevis and abductor halosis those are typical muscle um, in addition you can do uh, an unsphincter muscle for the tumor cases for the emg and mep recordings uh, minimum of tension should be used uh, the filter setting is 10 hertz low cut and high cut is 500 the sensitivity is between 200 to 500 microvolts uh, per division depending on the size of the signal and should and the sweep should for upper and lower should be 10 millisecond per division or total of 100 millisecond if you are doing epidural uh, recording so we can do we can do rec recording from direct from spinal cord by placing an epidural electrode. The epidural electrode has three contacts. It comes with one, two, or three contacts. Uh, the best one is using the uh, uh, 
uh, three contacts and we put above the tumor and below the tumor and we make a two channel one to two and two to three the filtering setters are set from 10 low cut and uh, three kilohertz higher cut and sensitivity about 20 microvolt and seep should be two millisecond per division and you can do averaging or one to three averaging uh, but uh, the most important is the pulse number of pulses is always one so we stimulate only one and in epidural d waves are recorded most only for small cord tumor cases intramedullary tumor um, and you cannot record below t9 so that because the t9 is the low spot where at the uh, the small cord start getting smaller and smaller so you cannot record below that so, so the uh, epi D waves, it has the first wave is always direct. D wave is direct wave. It's a direct activation of the spinal cord. That's why we call D wave. And it's followed by indirect activation of the cortical spinal tract. Those are known as I wave. They have I1, I2, I3, I4. And about 15 milliseconds, you get a muscle artifact from paraspinal muscle. is known as muscle artifact. And the latency of that artifact is about 15 milliseconds. The D wave response is about three millisecond from upper cervical six millisecond from lower cervical and nine millisecond for lower thoracic the i waves are one millisecond apart uh, i waves are affected by anesthesia but d waves they are not affected by anesthesia so as soon as you have higher anesthesia you'll see the loss of no you'll see, see no i wave but you have d wave intact um, this is a picture from one of the paper so the cooling of the spinal cord body so you can see the i waves they they disappear and but and there's a slight delay in the latency of d wave but uh, after the warming it come back uh, another important part about d wave is if you're doing it when you increase the stimulation you are uh, stimulating deeper in the brain so the latency of the d wave becomes earlier so there are three main criteria for data interpretation, either all and none. You have to look on waveform morphology and also look at the threshold. If you're doing a D-wave and muscle response, both of them, um, the recommended um, alarm criteria or the out like motor status post-operative is that D-wave is unchanged and muscle response is preserved. The patient motor status will be preserved. If the D wave is unchanged and you lose one or both uh, side of motor response, patient will have a temporary motor deficit, but it will recover within 72 hours. If the D wave is decreased up to 30 to 50 percent and there's no change in MEP, the motor status will be preserved. If the D wave is 32 percent decrease and you lose one or more uh, muscles in the lo lower extremity, patient will have a temporary deficit. But if the D wave is more than 50% degrees and loss of MEP in the extremities, patient will have long-term or permanent deficit. Stegnarat wake-up test is a very old, very common test before the motor function uh, test was introduced in the OR, FDA was approved. So that's waking up the patient. So we have to talk to the patient, tell, uh, train the patient pre-operatively like what's going to be done. And after instrumentation, wake up the patient and ask the patient to move and the patient moves. And that means the patient motor status is okay. And that's called known as Stegnara wake up test or just wake up test. It has a very high risk of uh, patient ex accidental intubation. Uh, patient can extubate. If the patient has um, a language, it may be difficult to communicate with the patient. If the patient has a disability or deaf, deaf uh, patient is deaf or cerebral palsy, it may be deaf, so difficult to communicate with the patient. And now the uh, signal wake up test is not done unless you are doing MEP and you lose your signal, then a signal wake up test will be one of the option to wake up the patient and see if it's a true loss or uh, something. So anesthesia is the easiest part. So, so that uh, general anesthesia, uh, that, uh, the part of general anesthesia is sed analgesia, sedation, amnesia, and muscle relaxation. What is uh, analgesia? Analgesia is suppression of pain. All the drugs used for the suppression of pain, they are known as analgesics. The drugs which are used for suppression of consciousness or to induce sleep is known as sedation. The drug used for amnesia, uh, for suppression of memory and experience is known as amnesic. Nitric oxide is one of the uh, 
best amnesic uh, inhalation agent. That's why most anesthesiologists, they want to use a, a nitrous during surgery. The patient doesn't wake up with any memory of the surgery. Muscle relaxation are not considered part of the muscle uh, anesthesia, but they are part of the anesthesia um, drugs uh, and it's suppression of the movement. So the, the anesthesia can be given by two methods. One is inhalation agent or injectable. The inhalation agents are administered in concentration value. So there's expired value and inspired value. We always look at the expired value, inspired over expired. The lower one is expired on the machine. Look at the expired value. And it is uh, administered in MAC, one MAC minimum alveolar concentration. And minimum alveolar concentration, one MAC is the value of uh, of an agent which causes 50% patient not to move by painful stimuli. If you change one, one MAC to reach to 1.2 MAC, 90% of patient will not move to that. So it's it's very sharp rise. So it's not a straight line uh, curve. Uh, so if you increase the, from 1 MAC to 1.2 MAC, there will be much more suppression. The one uh, drugs used in typically are isoferrin, desferrin, CO, nitrous oxide. Uh, and the one MAC value of XO is 1%, DES is 2%, uh, so DES is 6%, CO is 2%, nitrous is 106%. The factor that decreases the MAC, so the patient is very old, or patient is hypothermia, a patient is pregnant, or a decreased CNS neurotransmitter. So you will reach the MAC value at at a lower drug. So you have to be very very careful that the if you look at the concentration, patient will may have low concentration but have a more uh, suppression. The factor that increase the MAC value is hypothermia. It will be more uh, degradation of the drugs. And the factor, factors that don't affect the MAC is the duration of anesthesia and gender of the patient. So injectable agent, they are uh, given in IV. Uh, they can given in, in three ways. One is uh, a bolus or continuous infusion. Bolus is uh, mass dose of an agent uh, at an interval. And continuous inf infusion uh, is giving at a steady rate. Um, the new one is TCI or targeted control infusion. So it, they are checking the level and they are giving the targeted. So it's, there's no con there's no continuous uh, infusion and there's no measured bolus so it's, it's targeted uh, infusion. The IV anesthesia use a propofol, thiopent and ketamine, ketamine uh, and uh, increase our signals but it causes post-operative side effects so it's not used commonly. Narcotics that doesn't affect our signal are fentanyl, sufentanyl, fentanyl and the one which affect is muscle relaxant, flexinylacholine is ultra short acting and then intracurea, bacteria. The preferred anesthesia for is total intravenous anesthesia. Uh, that means, TIVA means no inhalation agent, no nitrous, no muscle relaxant. You can use propofol, using propofol up to 200, uh, maximum 250, uh, 220 microgram per kg per minute. If you go higher than that, you'll start losing the signal. Fentanyl infusion can be used from 0.01 to 0 .0, 0 0.3 microgram with no, and no muscle relaxant. The alternating is if they want to use some agent, so you got either nitrous 60, 65%, which is half mag, or DES or SIBO, half mag, plus uh, propofol, fentanyl, and no muscle relaxant. So just few graphs, but I'm just going to uh, skip them. So this effect of anesthesia, so if increase anesthesia, they will start. Uh, the muscle relaxants, uh, they wear off from face first. So the first is paralyzed first, then hand, and then foot. And when you're reversing, the face is reverse first hand, and then left leg is the foot, foot of the last one because of the blood supply. So the blood supply of the face is much higher. So the drugs reaches there quickly and get out quickly. So we have to make sure you're doing any uh, train of four or checking the muscle relaxation level from the foot, not from the hand. You can stimulate the medial, uh, posterior to medial malleolus and record from the foot muscle. And uh, this is, if you increase the stimulation, the normal threshold of the direct nerve is about two, three milliampere. If you're stimulating to the skin, it should be less than 10 milliampere. But if you increase the stimulation 35, 40, you can see the signal get bigger and bigger. So if don't start with 100 or 90 or 85 because that's not going to give you a good feedback. Mm -hmm. um, because when the train of four, you have four twitches. If you have three twitches, that means you lost 75 percent, 65 to 75 percent muscles. So losing one twitch means loss of 65 to 75 percent of the muscles. 
uh, losing two twitches. If you have two by four twitches, that means 85% muscles are paralyzed. If you have one twitch, that means 95% muscles are paralyzed and zero twitches 100%. So if you lose one, there's no measure to measure uh, that loss of muscle of 10%, 20%, 30%, or 50% up to 75% when you lose the whole twitch. So that is calculated by the threshold. So you want to get response at less than 25 or 30 milliampere. Getting more than 25, 30 milliampere, that means you are not trained up for. And according to the guidelines, if the signal is less than 90% of the first twitch, that's not considered as twitch. In order to have complete twitch, it should be 0.9 or higher. So you cannot have 0.7 and say, okay, I have trained four with 0.7 fade because 0.7 fade is not a twitch. Considered twitch. Uh, this is just again repetition. We have stimulation artifact, we have MEP. So for cranial nerve monitoring, for for uh, one of the most important part is always when you get a baseline, make sure uh, your pro most proximal muscle have the very early latency than the later muscles. If the foot is later and the uh, is early and hand is later, that means your signal are reversed. So most people I talk to, they never look at the latency, they just look at the response and they keep going. But latency is the most important part. So first thing, you get a response and then look at the latency to make sure. Because there's a paper published where the patient, does, they lost hand muscle and the patient woke up paralyzed, but they never realized that the hand was actually foot. And in that picture, the hand was a distal and the foot was more proximal. If you're doing, uh, we can do from the from the cranial nerve muscle, like this one you have uh, from Oris uh, or Vocalis for cranial 10 and contrabis for 11 and tongue from 12. But in order to do that, so we are using train of four and the ISA is very, very short because the um, the responses are earlier. So you have to make sure you are stimulating at lower threshold. And we can also do now we can beside the anal sphincter, we can for the pudendal nerve, we can do urethral electrode. Uh, we can uh, you can use the urethral electrode and the record from urethral sphincter for the quad equina or lumbar or tethered cord cases uh, because uh, if you're doing pudendal nerve monitoring and uh, you're getting response from anal sphincter those are different motor fibers than going from the bladder and most patient wake up with the bladder uh, urogenic bladder post operatively so one of the patient uh, did monitoring with this pre-op x-ray and have not a big scoliosis, less than 70% curve, but uh, we lost motor evoke potential and it came back and patient was okay post-operative. The point I'm trying to make is uh, doing the MEP very, very frequent is, is, is very critical. If you're doing a very, very, every five minutes or 10 minutes, that's too far and you, because the threshold of the gray matter is about uh, two to four sec minutes. So if you have gray matter ischemia and you have crossed two, two minutes, there's a chance of long-term deficit and four minutes is a permanent damage. The white matter tracks are from 11 minutes to 20 minutes. So uh, so if you, you can, they can tolerate ischemia between 11 to 20 minutes, so you don't want to go to that level. But we don't know if the ischemia is because of white matter or gray matter unless, so that's why, so you need to do uh, very quickly to identify so again this is one of the patients you can see that we have we lost MEP and they came back and uh, did correction another patient very simple scoliosis we put the 19 year old female patient was intact with no sensory or motor deficit and put the elect six screws and putting the six screws we lost uh, bilateral MEPs uh, quadriceps, tibialis, anterior, and foot on both side. Both side. Uh, Stop the surgery. The, um, the signal came back on the left side, but not on the right side. And post-operatively, patient, patient, patient was unable to move the leg and took the MRI. The patient had a stroke at T9, but uh, and then the screw was touching the vessel which was supplying that area, so it didn't hit the spinal uh, cord. But we lost both bilateral MEP. But it was picked up with. Uh, uh, within one minute and 50 seconds, uh, we are doing like the MEP every two minutes and it was the time between two MEPs was one minute 50 seconds. Uh, so the patient recovered within 72 hours and uh, she was walking two days later and she was running one week later. 
pathophysiology, so the compression of the bones, ligaments, uh, uh, disc herniated disc, tumors, they cause compression and you can cause injury. Disruptions of the neural tissue, edema, or compression, that if there's no direct trauma, even edema around the nerve can cause that. Uh, disturbance circulation, so vascular supply is the most important part. So even there's a disturbance of the vascular supply, it will affect our signals because it inhibits the motor uh, pathway. There are two types of injuries. One is direct injury and one is indirect injury. The direct injury are result from force applied directly to the back or to the neck or trunk or spinal cord. It may cause fracture of the spinal process of laminal arches, it cause concussion of the spinal cord. Uh, it can cause direct compression of the neural tissue uh, by depressed bone fragment. It causes laceration, uh, uh, like laceration to be knife or bullet wound can cause uh, direct injury. And the indirect injury are more common than direct injury. You've seen in the, um, the result from force applied to the head and trunk, uh, whiplash, something, a movement that exceeds the normal range. So sudden acceleration or a car accident, so the oh. indirect injury are most common. Oh, yeah. Hi. That's the end oh, of the presentation. So again, uh, presentation my purpose of doing this presentation was just going and ah. talking about uh, the basic of the pathway and uh, uh, the setup uh, about talking about digitimer and uh, very simple anesthesia. So you know uh, the pathway. So because the pathways are very important for this one, like, and call, also like, knowing yeah, about the digitimer is important because uh, when you are doing the programming, it's important to know how to do that. I don't know. Here. Yeah, they finished, I think they finished painting in there. Okay, thank they you again. Works, yeah. And if you have any question, you know how to find me. Uh, call me, email me, or I can go into more detail. Okay, thank you, everyone, and have a good night. <laughs>